Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and first of all a reminder our fall conference is getting closer November 13 through 15 and we have some of the most amazing speakers coming. Dr. Richard Ablin, the researcher who discovered prostate specific antigen, Kelly Turner, the author of Radical Remission, uh, Robert Whitaker, Anatomy of an Epidemic. I mean this is your chance to learn from the brightest and the best, to eat great food, hang around with us and who would not want to do that right? So you need to come to Columbus November 13 through 15 and learn more about all the cool stuff we do and listen to these world-class speakers. All right, a couple things to talk about. We're going to talk about cancer today. We're going to talk about it from two perspectives, and one is the risks associated with entering a clinical trial. So we'll just start with it's a sad reality that a lot of cancer treatments just don't work. Um, they will reduce tumors sometimes in the short term, change markers, but after a brief period of remission, the cancer often comes back with a vengeance. Um, I've been read I just finished reading Anatomy of uh, or uh, the Emperor of All Maladies, um, a biography of cancer, a fascinating book by the way. And uh, the author describes cancer as an astonishing perversion of a normal cell which requires the limitless capacity for cell division. Cancer cells are furthermore wily adversaries that mutate in response to treatment in order to survive and thrive. Well, um, some, acknowledge, some oncologists will acknowledge the futility of some treatments and just, you know, they're not going to extend life much and encourage patients to enter clinical trials. Patients will often be told that they'll have access to cutting edge treatments and sometimes made, they're made to feel that it's a real privilege to participate in the trial, but this is not always the case and I think it's important to be cautious. According to researchers C. Glenn Begley and Lee Ellis, sadly, this is a quote from their article, Clinical trials in oncology have the highest failure rate compared with other therapeutic areas. That was a quote from their article. They say that the results of most landmark, air quotes around that, preclinical studies show that new treatments uh, that, are, that are shown to be promising are simply not reproducible. Begley and Ellis report that in an analysis of 53 studies conducted by Amgen, so this is, this is a drug company reanalyzing its own results, um, and, and they looked at studies showing that new treatment methods or new ways to use already approved drugs might be promising. Only 6 out of 53 could be reproduced and this held true even after the authors of the study were contacted for guidance. Bayer was, the only one able to, uh, Bayer was only able to re reproduce the results of its own studies 25% of the time. Begley and Ellis say that in the studies that were not reproducible, which was most of them in both cases, uh, quote, data were not routinely analyzed by investigators blinded to the experimental versus control groups. In other words, bias caused the findings to look a whole lot better than they really were. Now, I can't under, uh, overstate the importance of, of this whole thing because the ability of different groups of researchers working under different conditions in different places with different funders uh, to reproduce study results prevents the misuse of data and either will strengthen the, the finding of a study or the inability to reproduce takes away from its strengths or finding um, and maybe sometimes uh, and, and often will just make a study be an outlier result. It's not reproducible, happened only one or two times and doesn't really end up meaning much in terms of the body of evidence that should drive medicine. Unfortunately, medical professionals and institutions don't demand the demonstration that results are reproducible and stand the test of time before making treatment recommendations to patients. And patients don't know that they should be asking about it, particularly in clinical trials when people have cancer and they're very desperate for solutions, etc. Begley and Ellis state that one of the problems is that journal editors, peer reviewers, and members of funding committees like scientific findings that are clear and complete, they don't like complexity and uncertainty. And I think a reality we have to face is that medicine is filled with complexity and uncertainty. But in any case, this incentivizes researchers to massage data and also to report and, and submit partial data to fit existing hypotheses. Now, I think personally that a contributing factor to the, to the idea that this goes on and on is that researchers at this time can rest assured that it's highly unlikely that their exclusion of data or manipulation of data will be discovered. Begley and Ellis suggest that investigators should be blinded, that's, uh, I agree, and that important research should be repeated by different researchers in the same lab to start with, and that all the findings should be reported, even those that are contradictory or negative, and, and that would give a much more balanced view of um, the value of a particular protocol. 
It's not likely to happen anytime soon, and here's why. There's not a lot of demand from the academic or medical community for more scientific rigor. The drug companies count on not being held to a high standard in this particular area in order to get their, drug, uh, their drugs and, and protocols approved and to keep them in the marketplace. But patients can start to put pressure on the marketplace by asking more questions and checking this out. So here's the bottom line. There is no question that there have been instances in which patients have benefited from cutting edge treatment and, and um, clinical trials. The, the, I, I acknowledge that. But that's not the case all the time. And what you want to make sure of, and, and you want to encourage family members or friends who are making these decisions, is that before proceeding, you know, don't, don't make your decision on, on just a doctor's recommendation. Look at the evidence and make sure that there is a real chance that you're going to improve or get benefit from a treatment um, and that you have some understanding of the potential side effects before signing up. Um, you know, don't, decisions should be made very carefully rather than just jumping on the first thing that sounds like a good idea uh, when you have a, uh, a cancer that it does not respond well to traditional treatment. Actually, I always say when you're diagnosed with cancer, back up and before you do anything, look at all the available options with a careful analysis of, of uh, benefits and risks because um, I know that uh, I know many people when they've, when they've taken the time to do that have decided not to, uh, not to do traditional therapy um, because it just wasn't going to do any good. And, you know, it, it, it often, you know, they'll, they'll talk about increased survival, 50% increased survival. Sounds wonderful, but if you're only going to live for four months, that's two more months of life. And then what price are you going to pay? All right, so now I want to finish on something hopeful. I have talked about the disaster of clinical trials. Most of them uh, are based on evidence that uh, is scant or non-existent. So let's talk about something that, that does work. Um, there are strategies that do, one of which is exercise. And I'll uh, point to or, or refer to the movie Forks Over Knives. Um, and if you see the movie, you know Ruth Heydrich, who's now in her 70s, uh, and, as her story is told in Forks Over Knives, had metastasized breast cancer. She had the, the breast amputated, but the cancer had metastasized to the liver and bone, which is a certain death sentence, uh, even today. Um, but uh, she managed to overcome the cancer with a vegan diet and exercise. And she stated in the film that people told her she was crazy. They, they said, um, you have cancer, you should focus on resting. Well, her approach worked. She said, I knew if I could build a strong body, I could overcome this cancer. And she did. Well, research supports Ruth's approach to cancer treatment. One study showed that riding an exercise bike 30 minutes a day improves survival with patients with gliomas, very aggressive cancers that are almost always fatal. The study included 243 patients who had advanced and recurrent malignant brain cancer. Patients who regularly exercised lived an average of 22 months, while those who didn't lived 13 months. There aren't any drugs at this point in time that add an extra, um, that many extra months of life to somebody who has malignant brain cancer. Another study involved 237 stage 3 colon cancer patients who underwent surgery and follow-up treatment. The researchers looked at survival time after recurrence. Patients who engaged in 18 hours or more of aggressive exercise per week were compared with those who engaged in less than 3 hours of intensive exercise per week. And the researchers reported a 29% reduction in the death rate for the aggressive exercise group. They also reported that exercise-related survival wasn't modified by sex, body mass index, number of positive lymph nodes, age, baseline performance status, adjuvant chemotherapy regimen, or recurrence-free survival period. In other words, it really was the exercise that did it. So I've always said this, if we could somehow, with these results, take exercise and put it in a pill, we would be billionaires because it has better outcomes, it produces better outcomes than most, if not all of the drugs on the marketplace today. And um, it's hard enough to get people to exercise. People who are perfectly healthy, it's sometimes very difficult to get them to do this on a regular basis. It can be even harder with cancer patients because they don't feel well, um, but also because they're almost discouraged from exercising. As Ruth said in the film, you know, people were telling me, you're crazy, you need to rest. Rest is needed for cancer patients. Actually living, exercising, eating well, that is what's needed for cancer patients. We need to get that word out. All right, that's all for today as usual. Pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you on Thursday with more news.